Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'll be talking today about uh, trading FBDEF for DRM. Uh, so my name is uh, Geert Uitroeven. Uh, I'm a freelance embedded uh, Linux kernel hacker. Uh, I'm uh, self-employed. Uh, I started with Linux as a hobbyist uh, a very, very long time ago, and I worked on uh, various platforms uh, and subsystems. Uh, what's most relevant for this presentation is that I used to be a maintainer of the Linux framework for device subsystem or FBDEF uh, also a long time ago. Uh, at that time, I also worked on uh, the X3 uh, X server for the framework for device support. And outside of uh, Linux, I also worked on the graphic subsystems when I was employed by uh, Sony. Um, Big fat warning, I'm no DRM expert, so please don't throw any of these objects to me uh, during or after the presentation. Uh, so what will this be about? Uh, so the Linux framework for device uh, subsystem was uh, officially deprecated in 2015. It means that no new drivers for the subsystem uh, are accepted and that all new graphics drivers must use the, the newer DRM uh, KMS uh, subsystem. Uh, we have plenty of old FBDEF drivers left, so what uh, will we do with them? There are also out of three drivers uh, in uh, various vendor VS VSPs, and uh, yeah, of course you want to know why was this decided, what can we do about it, and uh, what's the path to the future? I'll start with a short history about uh, Linux and uh, graphics and FDF. Uh, so probably all of you are familiar with uh, this message, which was uh, sent uh, by Linus Torvalds in 1991 when he started working on Linux. Um, at that time, the only thing Linux supported was the, initially the VGA text console um, for the kernel messages and for, for users for logging in on the console. And then later support was added to run uh, X servers like uh, X386, but there had been various other com uh, commercial ones at that time. And those managed graphics in user space. Uh, they handled mode setting directly and optionally, usually they had support for uh, hardware acceleration if your graphics hardware supported that, of course. So when Linux grew beyond uh, x86, uh, yeah, it gained support for many other machines and uh, several of them did not have VGA text mode, VGA graphics cards, and no VGA text mode. Uh, so how to solve that? Uh, what happened was that we got a proliferation of platform-specific console implementations. Basically, every port of Linux to a different platform with a graphical console implemented its own console, which was, of course, not uh, a good thing. So finally, in, uh, in 1995, uh, we got the uh, framework for device subsystem, which was the first platform independent framework to have graphical consoles on Linux. It was started by uh, Martin Schaller on, uh, on the Atari. Shortly after that, uh, he disappeared and I've never heard from uh, Martin again. Um, I have no idea what happened. Uh, I wrote a initial framework for device for the Amiga. And then later I moved to PowerPC and I started getting into work there as well on the uh, ATI Max 64 board. But before we could uh, get uh, framework for support more, to, to, before we could make it more generic and support it on all platforms, we first had uh, refactored uh, the console drivers so we could uh, uh, factor off all the, the commonalities because before all of those implemented everything. So the console uh, driver, I made it more modular and then we were ready to have uh, framework for device support on other uh, platforms, uh, first on PowerPC, then later we got it on Spark and on other ones of them. And then finally in uh, 1998, uh, Gerd Hoffman, he created Visa FB, which was uh, an implementation of a frame buffer driver using the Visa linear frame buffer, which means that uh, the BIOS on the PC would program a graphics mode and then Linux would use that. And then finally people could see the, the Penguin during boot up on x86 as well. So let's first have a look at uh, a simple uh, graphics hardware. Uh, so usually you, you have a CPU, which is, can write to a piece of memory, which is the frame buffer, and that memory contains a representation of a graphical image. It's read out by the CRT controller hardware and then displayed on a CRT. 
So this name CRT really stands for cathode ray tube. Um, not many displays still use that, but the name CRTC is still uh, running strong. As an example of a very simple graphics hardware, I have the Sun 350 workstation. Um, I don't know many people in this room still have used it. Uh, if I'm looking at some of them, I guess they have. Uh, Sun 3 was a very interesting platform because it was released uh, about one month before Intel released it, uh, the Intel 386 uh, processor. So the Sun 3s are more or less the, the oldest hardware that ever existed that you could run Linux on. And on the Sun 350, you had a, a monochrome uh, display of about 1 million pixels. Uh, that was really monochrome, black and white, so each pixel had uh, uh, one bit. Uh, I also have a picture of the motherboard here. Uh, here you see the four megabytes of system RAM. This is lots of uh, glue logic and I think probably also the, the, the RAM uh, chips for the, the 128K frame buffer. And it implements the CRTC controller, I have a very simple, with just a bit some uh, TTL counter, shift registers and gates, uh, and a clock head generator. And that's very simple graphics hardware that can show you a high resolution monochrome image. Now, how do you get more color in uh, graphics? A uh, way that was used a lot in the beginning was the concept of bit planes. So instead of just having one bit per pixel, you add another region of memory that contains a second bit per pixel, or even a third bit per pixel. With three bits, you can have simple RGB color, eight colors. Sounds nice. Another way is to put all the bits together inside the same byte or in the same word. Uh, this is what's mostly being done these days. The disadvantage of that is that usually you have to, to fit uh, a power of two number of bits inside the byte. So this was used for two, four, or eight, and later 16 and 20 or 34 bits per pixels. Um, while in the monochrome case, each bit represents either a black or a white pixel, if you actually go to grayscale, or color, uh, with grayscale, then the bits represent some grayscale value. With color, you could have a color lookup table. And for later, once you, uh, once you have sufficiently number of bits, like 16 or 24 per pixel, you can just put the RGB value in the pixel directly. And the third way is to use some uh, interleaved way where the, you, you have uh, everything looks contiguous in memory, but uh, it's not really is. So, uh, in this example, you, you have uh, uh, eight, the first bit of uh, the eight first pixels is stored in the first byte, and the second bit of the first eight pixels is stored in the second byte, and so on. So the, you had memory organizations of, uh, like that as well. Now, what was the frame buffer device API? Uh, it was actually very simple. You had a way where you could map the device def FBX, and then you just get access to the graphics memory directly. Application can write right to it and it's shown on the screen immediately. Uh, it's a very flexible way, um, but it does mean that the application needs to know about whether you are using bit planes or interleaved bit planes or whether you're using packed pixels with everything packed together or not. Uh, so that means that uh, your application needed to support exactly what the hardware could do. Uh, besides mapping the frame buffer, there were also uh, IOCTLs introduced to uh, query the frame buffer mode or to change the mode and also to manipulate the color. Uh, FBDEF also has support for acceleration, which is optional. So inside the kernel, you can have simple acceleration for, uh, to get a performant text console because uh, yeah, you need much more um, uh, memory bandwidth to have a graphical console than a VGA text console. Uh, user space can uh, implement acceleration to also by mapping the DevFBX device, um, and then user space can write to the hardware registers of the, the graphics card directly. There was support for some of those in, uh, in the old X386. Uh, for uh, graphics hardware where the, the frame buffer itself is not directly mapped into the CPU's address space, uh, later some way was introduced, which is the deferred I.O. So basically you have an additional buffer of memory and you set up the, the page table such that uh, you get that uh, you can monitor when it's being written to the page and then regularly you can update, send the updates to the, the real uh, uh, graphics card. 
Now uh, about uh, the text console. Um, so uh, FBDev also implemented a, a, a text console on top of the, the graphics uh, named uh, FBCon. So on the left you see uh, there's a, a sliding window of a rectangle going over a buffer of memory. The buffer of memory in memory is a, a buffer of uh, text and attributes bytes, which is identical to what was used on uh, PGA text mode. So all that code could be uh, uh, reused. So if you scroll the, the text console, then basically this rectangle moves, uh, moves over the, the, uh, the memory. If the window moves uh, across memory uh, on VGA uh, text. With the frame buffer console, uh, you also have to, when something is written to the console or any other change is made, like scrolling, then the representation in the frame buffer has to be updated as well. Um, to make this performant, some tricks are used. So as I said before, you could have, with FVDEF, you can have some optional hardware acceleration inside the kernel. Uh, first one is for actually rendering uh, the characters. So when you render the, the character like an A, you go from a, a bitmap font, which is, has uh, one bit per pixel, and you have that to write to graphics memory and expand it to use the, the background and foreground color you want for your text. Uh, some graphics hardware has acceleration, hardware acceleration for that, which is very useful if the memory bandwidth from the CPU to the graphics memory is very slow. Um, other graphics hardware has support for uh, uh, copying or clearing rectangles, which is also useful for uh, scrolling. And the third possible uh, optimization is uh, panning the screen. Uh, which I show here, which is basically similar to what was used on the VGA text console, but now on, uh, on the graphics buffer. So you have the full graphics buffer here, and this follow forms a window in the memory. And when you scroll one line, you just have to, to draw one additional line of text here and move the window down. A second option is uh, if the hardware support is to use wrapping, which means that uh, instead of a window moving over the rectangle, you basically have something that continues here. So uh, here's the split between the, the, the top of the memory and the bottom of the memory. And you can, for scrolling, you just have to change some hardware registers and the hardware takes care of that. Uh, if these uh, optional hardware acceleration features are available, then uh, FBCon can and will use different scrolling stat strategies depending on what's available. Uh, it can use panning or wrapping if available. If, if not, the OSNOR are not available, it can uh, refrain to, to using the, the, the blitter to copy areas. And, uh, and the third thing is the smart redraw, uh, which is basically uh, if, if you scroll the screen and you have uh, two characters, the same characters on top of, of each, each other, then it means that if you scroll one line up, that one of them does not have to be redrawn because the same character is already present. That's also small uh, optimization that can uh, be useful. So in those days, the graphics stack uh, looked like this without frame buffer devices, which is the traditional one, which was mostly used on x86. Uh, you had the X server running in user space. It's just a mapping dev mem and perhaps the dev uh, IO port as well to, to do IO access. And then the X server is responsible for all of mode setting, drawing to the frame buffer, and implementing hardware acceleration by writing to the graphics cards registers. When FBDEF entered the picture and was used, then the, uh, the X server would open DEF FBX. Instead of DEF MEM, uh, mode setting would be handled by the frame buffer driver inside the kernel, and the X server would only be responsible for the actual drawing and optionally for hardware acceleration. Then evolution continued and graphics hardware gained many more features and complexity increased. So we got set buffers uh, for simple 3D acceleration. We got real 3D acceleration with the 3D graphics engines, uh, overlays uh, for video, typically using YCBCR instead of RGB formats. Uh, the hardware could have multiple planes, uh, multiple displays. You could configure which planes were shown on which display, move planes and overlays independently. Uh, basically, all of this became a bit impossible to handle with FBDEF, so uh, something new had to be found. Uh, yeah, I'm showing also the, uh, the memory is no longer showing a, 
containing a simple frame buffer, which is a direct mapping of, of what's shown on the screen, but it has memory, mem memory regions containing the display planes, also containing uh, texture buffers for, for the 3D graphics, uh, command commands with 3D acceleration, uh, commands geometry data, lots of stuff that uh, was very difficult to handle with FD dev. So in 1999, we got the first implementation of the direct rendering infrastructure with the direct, direct rendering manager of DRI and TRM. That was demoed by uh, Precision Insight at Linux Expo 1999. I've been there, I've seen the demo. Uh, so DRM implemented a 3D acceleration and uh, in DRM the actual driver part is split in two parts, a small driver inside the kernel which just provides a way for, to send commands to the hardware and most of the actual 3D graphics programming is done in user space which prepares commands and sends them to the kernel. Um, in those days desktop graphics already got uh, more colors than before so uh, there was some, is some support for 256 colors in DRM but most uh, graphics hardware for desktop applications you started using uh, RGB uh, with 24 or 32 bits per pixels and also uh, video formats. Uh, DRM supports multiple planes, overlays, uh, there's some memory management handling for, for all the handling all the different planes and the command queues and whatever. It's much more complex than FBDEF and it has a zillion of helpers uh, to make driver programming easier but it's uh, sometimes very difficult to know uh, which helper you should use. Um, after the initial hardware acceleration, then DRM also gained a feature uh, called kernel mode setting. I always thought that was a funny name because I thought that's what FBDEF does, no? Uh, but basically it's about, uh, yeah, it's about the mode setting. So with DRM KMS implemented, the graphics stack uh, uh, moved on to what's shown in the, the third column. Uh, so user space is now opening dev DRI. Uh, DRM takes care of all of mode setting, buffer management, and uh, hardware acceleration background, which is the sending the commands to the hardware. And the user space just draws into the frame buffer and does hardware acceleration. To provide a console on top of DRM, uh, DRM relies on the FB dev emulation. So uh, DRM still uses FBDEF and it exposes a frame buffer device uh, for that, uh, which can also be used for user space. So user space applications that use the FBDEF API can work, assume they do not want to change the mode, uh, the video mode, because that can only be done through DRM directly. But old FBDEF applications can still open the device and draw and it works. Um, at the bottom I'm showing the, the new image of how uh, uh, the text console works. So you still have the text attributes, but for like in VGA, then that's rendered to a shadow frame buffer in main memory. This one is uh, uh, exposed to user space to def FBX. This deferred IO, uh, which I talked about is also still used. So to, to track that if user space writes to this memory here, that uh, to make sure that the real frame buffer handled by FBDEF is updated. So that means that this, for, uh, when something is drawn on the console, it's first rendered here and then it's copied and possibly converted to a different format and written to the real frame buffer. Now, what's the problem with FBDEF? Um, so already in 2012, uh, our dear friend uh, Laurent Penchard suggested that we should get rid of uh, frame buffer devices. And then finally, in, uh, a bit later in 2015, the, the at that time uh, maintainer of the frame buffer device subsystem, uh, Tommy Valkainen, said uh, that there would become be a moratorium on new FBDEF drivers. Why? Uh, the main reason for that is that uh, FBDEF was not suitable for the contemporary graphics hardware. Uh, 
also the fuzzer started to that were running on uh, for various uh, Linux systems started uh, finding lots of issues and some of them were traced back to FBDAM, rightfully or not. That's uh, something to be uh, left out of the picture or maybe not. Um, another issue was that FBDEV uh, was essentially unmaintained. Uh, after I stopped maintaining FBDEV, many other people helped there and uh, I definitely want to, to thank them. Uh, but basically, as of 2020, there was no real FBDEV maintainer anymore. Uh, we only had uh, DRI Devil was supposed to be CC'd on all patches there because they were interested in it because DRM uses the FB dev emulation and have begun to get, write a console. In the beginning of this year, uh, Helge Deller took over uh, as the new FB dev maintainer. Um, he made immediately some uh, decision that turned out to be a bit controversial with some people. Uh, more about that later, but uh, I definitely want to thank all the people who uh, were uh, former FB dev maintainers and uh, the current one as well, because it, it still think it's worth thanking them. During uh, the last uh, years, uh, many of the if some of the FBDEV features were uh, slowly removed or made uh, less usable. Uh, one issue there was that uh, because the, well, the, there was no FBDEV maintainer or sometimes it was not that responsible, it turned out that FBDEV was de facto maintained by the DRM maintainers, which I consider a little bit... Uh, conflict of interest because they were not interested in really keeping FBDEV alive. They just had to use FBDEV because of the, the console. There have been talks about using other ways to have a console, KMSCon, perhaps even from user space, because that could solve the limitations of the current console, which is, for example, that you have 8-byte uh, characters, so you cannot use full Unicode uh, and things like that. Um, the DRM maintainers, they're also user working mostly on very performant hardware and uh, they were focusing mostly on, uh, on scrolling by redraw, which means that all the, the panning and wrapping and copying features, they were not really used by DRM because, on, on, for example, on the Intel hardware, it's much faster to just let the CPU uh, redraw the whole, re-render the whole screen uh, uh, than to, to use uh, some other ways. Uh, in uh, kernel 5.9, we got the scroll back feature, which is the, was the control page up uh, thing on the console was removed. Later it was also removed from VGA, but mostly because of security issues. And um, lots of the hardware acceleration was removed in version 5.11. The claim for that was that it was not used. Yes, it was indeed not used by the DRM drivers, but there were tens of FBDEV drivers that were still using it, despite my complaint that was uh, removed. Uh, since then, the uh, decision has been reverted by the new FBDEV driver uh, maintainer, which was uh, at that time quite controversial. Uh, one other thing is that uh, recently I discovered that several of the security issues were actually caused by uh, missing range checking in the FBDEV emulation in DRM, so there were not real bugs in the FDF core. Now we know that they're being fixed, uh, which is good, of course. So uh, the official policy is that we should uh, migrate from FBDEV to DRM, so uh, I worked a bit on that, and here are my uh, experiences. Since 2015, no new FBDEV drivers. Since then, there's been lots, about, lots of discussions about what should we do? Oh, but uh, it's very easy to write a very simple DRM driver. Just look at the existing tiny drivers. But I just looked at the current code, which is after lots of cleanups, and the smallest tiny DRM driver is still 50% larger than the, the, the simplest FBDEV driver. So it, it used to be even worse. Uh, DRM people have been pointing to this simple DRM thing since at least 2015. I always said, uh, can you show me a very simple driver? So as an example to convert, but not much happened. Then I discovered simple DRM was even mentioned in already in 2013 and it was finally merged upstream in 2021 for driving firmware frame buffers like uh, EFI and uh, older open firmware. So those are small examples 
And then, of course, the question is, what do we do with the existing FBDF drivers that do not have a DRM counterpart? There are still about 100, which surprises uh, many people. And what do we do with the out-of-tree drivers? So, should we convert all the FBDF drivers to DRM drivers? Why not? Now, the typical reasons uh, why not uh, tackle the task are uh, listed here. There's no time to do that. It's mostly for old hardware. I don't have access to it. DRM is complex. I don't know how it works. I don't have time to look into it. Are there missing features? I thought there were, but it was very difficult to show that without code. More about that later. 2019, uh, Thomas Zimmerman, he wrote some uh, patch series to, uh, with conversion helpers, which would make it easier to just take a VDEV driver, add some glue code called the helpers, then clean up the result and get it upstream. Most of that did not end up upstream, except for some helpers. And then, did I mention there are zillions of helpers to choose from, and it's difficult to know which one. So for years I've been thinking about uh, showing uh, how good or how bad it is to convert an FBDF driver to DRM. Uh, so I picked the Atari DRM driver. I don't have an Atari hardware, but the nice thing about Atari is that you can run it in the Aranim emulator. Aranim stands for Atari runs anywhere, uh, which is much more convenient than on the real hardware. I still have an Amiga, which I could use, but uh, I wanted to start with Atari first because that's easier. So on the Atari hardware supports uh, various video modes, uh, like the monochrome, which is actually two colors because it's not just black and white, you can pick any two colors. Supports uh, four, 16, 256 colors using interleaved bit planes, which means that the bits are spread out a bit. It also supports 16 bit uh, RGB, big Andean mode, very important. <laughs> so uh, after Thinking about that for many years, I finally started in 2020 to get something working, but it failed and I gave up. And, but then we got a new uh, FBDEV maintainer and lots of discussions about uh, FBDEV and DRM early this year. I thought it's the time to, to start working on getting it ready for real. I have something that works, still not ready for submission, but, uh, but it's a start. So what were the issues I had? So DRM supports only color index frame buffers with 256 colors, which basically means one byte is per pixel. So I, first I had to support for the new formats. Uh, DRM itself does not render anything into the screen. It just needs to know about the formats and some of their properties. Rendering to the screen is either done through user space or through the FBDEV emulation for the console. Um, I also ordered support for that to uh, the mode test binary from the test utility from uh, libdrm, uh, so you could show the the picture, uh, the test images there. Uh, as the C2 and C4, uh, as the C1 and the C2 formats have only very limited number of colors, I implement uh, dithering there, I mean, dithering in monochrome and dithering with simple RGB. Then adding, of course, the formats was not sufficient, then it crashed in various places because uh, there were many assumptions in DRM that the pixel is at least one byte. So if the pixel, as soon as the pixel is uh, smaller than one byte, you get uh, divisions by zero and, uh, and other stuff like that. And while at that, I also added uh, definitions for the formats uh, R1248 and D1248, which are meant for, uh, for monochrome displays, so mostly grayscale or uh, the R ones for uh, for grayscale, typically the R they use the in RGB you have red, green, blue, and the convention apparently is that if you have a single channel that you call it the red channel, even if it's not red but grayscale or purple or whatever. And then the D the D ones they are meant for hardware where uh, there's a inverse relationship between channel value and brightness, which means that uh, that zero is uh, the lightest and, for example, 255 is the darkest. I have no immediate use for those, but it's still there. Uh, DRM, the color lockup table is always 256 bytes for now. Uh, probably that's overkill and we should fix that. The main reason for that is because it also doubles as a, a gamma table. To make use of all these, these new formats, you probably have to update your user space if you, you're interested in, in using that. 
And uh, most of these things are now uh, finally queued for uh, V6.1. They showed up in Linux Next at the time, uh, a bit early before, but uh, it was not there. And then the mode test uh, fixes I submitted for libdrm, they're, they're still not applied. A second issue I had was then the, the endianness. So DRM formats are defined to be little endian, unless the the identifier of the, the mode has bit 31 set. Sounds nice. Warning, old drivers on PowerPC, I assume, because that was the, most, the other big Indian system that was using DRM. Uh, they, the drivers may use old native Indians. That's considered a bug. New drivers should set this flag and be done with it. And then the FVDEV emulation for the console translates the if you request one of the formats, you translate it to the, the other one. Good. So now, what does it mean for NDNS? So if you have a 32-bit pixel with you know, four bytes, and then three bytes red, green, blue, and if you have big NDN, then it's different. So the remapping of the modes, it's, you'd get from one uh, mode with one byte per pixel to another mode with uh, uh, one byte per, per color value. With 16-bit, that doesn't work like that because you have this uh, annoying split here in the middle, so the green ends up uh, in both pieces. So, and it's interesting when I finally tried that, uh, it turned out that those formats were not recognized by DRM, so there was some support for it, but not there. Uh, DRM had lots of conversion helpers to convert uh, RGB, for example, if uh, you want. Uh, um, you can convert from 32-bit uh, RGB to, to a lesser format. And those conversion handles, most of them lacked Indian handling as well. Uh, I fixed mode test on big Indian too. I was a bit surprised, so since I thought DRM was used on PowerPC, that simple test utilities like mode test would support uh, big Indian as well, but apparently not. I'm going to skip some parts because we're running slowly out of time. But the conversion helpers are fixed now. Uh, they are queued for v6.1. libdrm support is missing. Another thing is the, we have with the old graphics hardware is that they typically were used with uh, analog video modes. Uh, Maxim Repair is also working on analog TV, which is slightly related, but I'll, I'll skip on. If you remember our, our old analog TV work, it was basically an, an electron beam which is uh, controlled by magnetic fields to move over the screen and paint, uh, uh, light up ph phosphors. And then, uh, what's fixed in the video in the video mode is actually the number of lines you have, but how many pixels you have per line that depends on the analog bandwidth. If you have a digital computer, of course, you have a clock and you have a fixed number of pixels, but this can be quite uh, variable. Also, with the old CRTs, you, you have this, uh, the overscan region here, which some of parts may be visible or may not be visible. Um, you don't have a way to find out what the capabilities are the moment of the screens are. Digital displays, it's much easier these days. They have a fixed number of pixels, and you usually don't want to use any other video mode because else you get uh, uh, fuzzy data. Interesting in digital displays that you still have the in actual interfaces on HDMI, for example, it's basically a digitized digital version of the old analog timing, so there are still some parts there. And there are some displays that use different interfaces. Uh, but for the analog things, it's uh, all drivers that were used to work with analog screens, you, you could uh, need various video modes. One nice thing about DRM is that it expects that most everything works with uh, uh, the format called XR24, which is basically a 24-bit per or 34-bit per pixel RGB mode. Uh, even drivers for monochrome displays implement this. They don't implement uh, a monochrome format because it didn't exist uh, until the low-color patches. So it works with everything. It's very suitable for desktop graphics because nobody else, uh, nobody wants less than uh, than RGB color. But it may be overkill for the, the lesser systems. Eh? You have to, to copy and convert uh, stuff like that. Uh, so traditionally, the DRM drivers for monochrome displays, they take the RGB 32-bit per pixel data, they convert it to 8-bit grayscale, and then convert it to, eight, to monochrome. And 
yeah, uh, on the modern Intel graphics hardware, they claim to have uh, 10 gigabytes per second uh, bandwidth, but not all systems have that, especially in the older ones or embedded ones. Also, other issues because if, if the, the applications are not aware that how many colors there really are, then they cannot optimize for the screen. On the left, you see the, the normal 256 color penguin. If you try to display that uh, a bit, if the system thinks you have uh, RGB uh, disp capabilities, then you get the left uh, penguin, and then uh, it's been after conversion to black and white, you get something like that, which is uh, really bad. Also, if you have a gray text on a gray background or a blue text on a red background or something like that, you may end up with something that's not, not readable at all. So what's the status of the Atari DRM driver? Uh, I got all the pixel formats working, text console is working, I get more text working, more text working, conversion uh, from uh, RGB to uh, uh, 256 colors basically conversion to RGB 32 works, conversion to the big engine RGB 16-bit uh, RGB works. Um, I can do video mode programming, so it supports almost all the same video modes as the old uh, frame buffer device driver. FB test works, using FB dev emulation. What can be improved? Uh, my major headache now is the video uh, mode programming code because it's uh, very complicated and uh, Despite all the helpers, I don't know, really know, still know, don't know what helpers I should really use and whether I can make it simpler. Um, there should be a way to allocate the, the shadow frame buffer from the, the actual video RAM, so to avoid using the native 16-bit big engine uh, RGB 565 format, to avoid having to convert that from, uh, from big to little engine or vice versa. I have tested on Aranim only, so I cannot provide you with... Uh, benchmarks on real hardware. What about performance? I don't have benchmark data from real hardware, but I can tell you about the kernel size. So kernel size increased by almost 300K because DRM, it includes uh, things I don't need on my uh, Atari, like I2C and HDMI and IQ domain code. Uh, due to shadow frame buffers, it consumes much more RAM as well. Uh, so yeah, that's what we lose. On the Aranim emulator, the text console became 10 times slower. So now it's drawing into uh, for 16 color, four bit per pixel packed shadow frame buffer. And when that something changed there, it has to be converted to the interleaved bit planes. Oh yeah, probably we should find a way to uh, improve. Is all of this still relevant? All the legacy hardware is obsolete, no? And your smartphone can do 3D graphics fine. But we still have low-end embedded platforms, small displays, limited amount of RAM, the typical things there. Uh, one example here is a, a one megapixel e-ink display, which is a monochrome display. It's about si similar to, uh, to what we had in the Sentry 50, so you need just uh, the same amount of video RAM like on the Sentry. If you need a shadow buffer in 32-bit uh, per pixel support, you, you, would, you, you consume all the other RAM in the Sentry just for the shadow frame buffer. Uh, if you have to convert to grayscale in between, then you need a second Sentry just because you need more memory for that. Fortunately, these days, the, such a one megapixel e-ink display win, will end up in a modern e-reader. And a modern e-reader has uh, easily two hundreds of times the amount of RAM as the old Sun tree. So if you would uh, show the same images like you used to show on a Sun tree, then you need a stack that goes here uh, to the room. Other things like uh, are this uh, interesting display. It's a seven color e-ink display. It uses four bits per pixel. So how do you model that? Perhaps with C4, which assumes uh, that you have 16 colors, but you need a fixed palette. DRM does not have support for, for fixed color things yet, so FBDEF used to have that as well. So conclusion, I think we can convert FBDEF drivers to DRM drivers. I think I've identified most of the mission functionality and I sent patches uh, to handle that.
What do we gain? The most important one is the common user space that we don't have to care about bit planes versus pixels or whatever strange format your hardware may use. You can just have one simple PAX pixel format there. Uh, we could finally implement support for the old Amiga hold and modify mode. Uh, perhaps we can get rid of FBDEF, less subsystem to maintain. But what we do give up mostly is then a low memory consumption and performance. So uh, yeah, we're running out of time, uh, so, but I think I'm finished. I'd like to thank uh, a few people here. And perhaps we can take one question. No, stop, okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much.